what we get is 12.5 pi cubic centimeters. Well, that's quite a bit of amplification. So if you're off by even a tenth of a centimeter in the radius and the height, you could be off by roughly this much in the computed volume. And to illustrate this, let's compute the actual volume in a case where we are off by that much. So V5.1, 10.1, compute that volume. What we get is 262.701 pi cubic centimeters. Whereas if it's five and 10, all we got was uh, 250 pi. So the actual error is 12.701 pi. So we're talking 40 cubic centimeters for what to take the pi into account. So that's pretty bad. Yep. Now we want, to, we do want to make this as large as possible, otherwise we won't even be in the ballpark. Because what if you have a situation where some, one of these partial derivatives is negative? You gotta take that into account. So here we're just trying to get a, a simple bound, which is, which we can get no matter how complicated the uh, original function is. Plus the fact that we don't, we only know roughly, we, we only know ballpark for how large the error can be in R and H. We could say it can be at most this much. So don't assume that when you have quantities that are quite accurate, that that accuracy is going to be preserved as you do other things with those values, especially when, in this case, you're multiplying things together. So if we take a closer look at this, look at pi r plus delta r squared h plus delta h. If we were to expand that out, we get r squared plus 2r delta r plus delta r squared h plus delta h. So we get pi r squared h, the exact volume, plus 2 pi r h delta r plus pi r squared delta h plus additional terms that are going to be smaller. So notice the error in r is amplified by r and h. The error in h is amplified by pi r squared. So we can see from here why uh, a small change in r or h can cause a large change in the volume. Now all of this is about functions of two variables, both of more than two. It all works out in a very similar way. You have a function of n variables and the linearization of f at some point. Now to indicate this point, I'm going to put a superscript of zero. This is like our x not y now. We're linearizing around this point. Is this function. So it'll be the function value at that point plus partial derivative with respect to x1. And I'm going to do a, use a shorthand here. I'm going to call this vector p naught, just so I don't write quite so much. Plus all the partial derivatives evaluated at the same point. So here we have partial derivative with respect to x1 times the change in x1, and then same for x2, x3, and so on, all the way to xn. So however many variables we have, it's the same idea. The linearization is the value of function at that point, and then you take each of the partial derivatives, multiplying by the change in the corresponding variable. But as you can see, once you get the higher numbers of variables, it all gets very cumbersome. So, different way we can write that. Of course, we could use our old friend from 169 sigma notation. So we're summing from i equals one to n partial with respect to xi times a change in coordinate i. Right, so that's another way of writing it. The way I actually prefer to write it is this. So we define the gradient of f at this point p naught to be this vector. And when it's a gradient, we tend to write it as a row vector and You'll see why a little later on. We take all the partial derivatives, starting with the first variable, evaluated at that point, and we arrange them in a row vector. So then if we write it this way, we have a simpler way of writing the linearization. So if I let p, this vector p, be any point in n-dimensional space, then the linearization around p is going to be, as usual, a function evaluated at p naught, plus we take the gradient of f at p naught, dot product with the difference of these vectors, p minus p naught. So the difference between this general point in n-dimensional space and and the point around which we're linearizing. Now, I'm running it this way so that you can compare this with what we know from a one-dimensional case. So in 1D, we have the linearization being equal to the value of the function at that point plus the derivative times the difference in, in variables. So it's all the same, except now we're just working with vectors instead of scalars to represent our variables. So we're still valuing the function at the point around which we're linearizing. Here we have a derivative, but now we have a gradient. Here we have regular multiplication. Now it's a dot product. Here we have a change in variables. Here, again, we have that, only now they're vectors. So we see that there isn't really that much of a radical change going from one variable to several. So just to refresh everyone's memory, make sure we're all on the same page. Dot product, also known as the inner product of two vectors, u and v, is written this way. So you take corresponding components and you multiply them. So u1, v1 plus u2, v2. So these are the components of u, these are the components of v. So we multiply corresponding components and add them all up. Another definition which you would see in a physics class, most likely, is the magnitude of u, magnitude of v, has a cosine of the angle between them. 
is one of the main applications of a dot product is to compute the angle between vectors. And if they're perpendicular, this angle is 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, cosine of it is 0. So if a dot product is 0, the vectors are orthogonal. So let's look at an example of this for a function of free variables. So we're going to take this function, and we're going to linearize it around this point. First, we need to compute its gradient at that point, which means we're just going to compute all of the partial derivatives. So what's the partial derivative with respect to x? 6xy cubed z to the fourth. So fx at this point, trouble plugging in, is 48. fy, 9x squared, what? y squared z to the fourth. So we plug in the point, and we get 36. And then, finally, fz, 12x squared y cubed z cubed. 1, 2, minus 1, turns out to be minus 96. So the gradient of f at this point is this row vector, where we put fx, fy, fz. So it's 48, 36, minus 96. So now, we have enough information to write down, oh, I, almost. We need to compute a function value at this point that is 24. So now we can write down the linearization of this function at this point. So we get 24 of a function value plus the gradient of f at 1, 2, minus 1 times the difference between the vectors x, y, z, and 1, 2, minus 1. So we're going to get, and that's a, that's a dot product, so we have our vector, 48, 36, minus 96, dot product with x minus 1, y <coughs> minus 2, z plus 1, and then we can work out all of that. So we're going to multiply corresponding components, so 48 times x minus 1, 36 times y minus 2, and add them all up. And that is our linearization around that point. Now let's use this linearization. Let's take a look at value function f at 1.1, 1.9, minus 1.1. So we're just going off by a tenth either way from this point. The actual function value is roughly 36.5, but the linearization at that same point turns out to be 34.8. So kind of far off, certainly more so than the previous example, the very first one we did. So these small changes in the x, y, and z values, why is amplified to cause a large change in the function value. What is it about this function that causes that to happen? How can we tell just from this? These are pretty steep slopes, 48, 36, minus 96. Whereas if those partial derivatives have been smaller in magnitude, change in x, y, or z would not have caused an error like that. Now, so we, when we go to several variables, we can express the linearization as a dot product of the gradient and a difference of vectors. But we're still talking about scalar valued functions. So however many inputs they take, they still take only a single output. What about vector valued functions? Vector valued functions. So this takes in n variables, but it outputs n variables. So its value is going to be, at any point, it's going to be a vector, and it's going to have several component functions. It's going to have m of them. So when you're computing partial derivatives, each one of these is going to have a gradient of its own. So to convey all the information you have about rates of change, you have to take into account all n of these variables and all m of these outputs. So what we call the derivative, this is a term that is used in Morrison actually, or a term that's more commonly used, the Jacobian matrix of a you know, vector valued function at a given point is the matrix is commonly denoted using an uppercase J and there's an indication of what function it's for and what point it's being evaluated at. And what we have here is a matrix where each row is gonna be the gradient of one of these component functions. So we have gradient of F1 up here, gradient of F2 under it, all the way down to the gradient of Fm. But then each of these is a row vector containing N partial derivatives. So if we wanna see what the whole thing looks like, so your columns correspond to variables, so independent variables that you're differentiating with respect to. Your rows correspond to dependent variables, your outputs, your component functions. So you're gonna have partial of F1 with respect to X1, partial of F1 with respect to X2, and so on, all the way out to Xn. Then in the next row, you go to the next component function with respect to X1, X2, to Xn. And all of these are evaluated at P0 all the way down to the very last component function with respect to the very last variable. So you have this matrix of m rows and n columns that represents the uh, derivative. So when n and m are both equal to 1, that's just the derivative that you've known from single variable calculus. It's all the same thing. Even in this case, where we have several inputs and several outputs, we have a concise way of writing the linearization at a given point. So it's just the function value, which is now a vector at P0, plus the Jacobian matrix at P0, times a difference in vectors, the point you're evaluating and the point you're linearizing around, 